Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Ian Tuttle of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, as usual. And, Ian, we start with news from the Pew Research Center. Certainly not a partisan poll for, for the most part. They certainly don't lean right. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and when it comes to uh, how voters think the two parties handle different issues, it's very interesting. Republicans looking very good heading into a presidential election year on the issue of foreign policy, particularly as it dominates the headlines when it comes to which party is better to deal with the terrorist threat at home. Republicans with a 20-point edge, 51% to 31%. Foreign policy overall, 48% to 35%. Not necessarily related to national security, but on taxes, they also enjoy a healthy double-digit lead, 47 to 36%. The big head-scratcher here, Democrats still have a seven-point lead after all this time on health care. But uh, if foreign yeah. policy is a major issue in 2016, it looks like the GOP has a built-in advantage there. That's right. And it's striking news because you'll recall that, of course, after uh, George W. Bush's administration, the foreign policy of Republicans was taboo. And the Democrats had a significant edge in sort of promoting what we might call a generally isolationist or um, foreign policy oriented toward withdrawing and reducing America's so-called police power abroad. And what we're seeing is the result of that uh, in the headlines now, which is that all of those countries, Russia, China, terrorist outfits in the Middle East, saw that the United States was not willing to act and uh, have seized their opportunity. So voters are starting to realize that you need a much more aggressive foreign policy. Republicans need to be vigorous in promoting this when it comes to 2016. And and they'll have the opportunity, I think, to do so, particularly if their opponent ends up being former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, because despite the fact that she was America's uh, chief diplomat, anyone, even a uh, sympathizer with their Hillary 2016 t-shirt, would (laughs) find it difficult to name a single genuine foreign policy accomplishment in her tenure. And Republicans uh, should be willing to um, beat that drum incessantly. Yeah, they can certainly saddle her with that. It looked briefly. They were certainly taking credit for the Arab Spring until that literally blew up in their faces uh, with Benghazi and obviously what happened in Egypt and so many other places. The Syrian red line, you you know, take your pick with all that. And it certainly looks at this point, uh, most of the major foreign policy headaches out there right now, radical Islamic terror, Russia, and even China, as you mentioned, uh, those issues aren't going anywhere. It's just a matter of how much attention they'll be getting during that cycle. Exactly right. All right. On to the bad martini now. And this is one we saw coming for a number of weeks, but it finally happened on Thursday. The vote from the five members on the Federal Communications Commission. There's three Democrats on the panel, two Republicans. It was a three to two vote. Yes, it was along party lines to pass the mystery plan, uh, the net neutrality plan that no one was allowed to see except the five members of the commission, members of Congress not allowed to see it. The government takeover of the Internet, we'll see if that's exactly what's in here, but uh, certainly more government regulation of the Internet, which a lot of folks think will lead to poorer service and eventually higher rates uh, for customers uh, on the Internet. And uh, the worst fears, of course, is that eventually content and and free speech rights could be infringed here. So, Ian, a a lot of uh, chewed off fingernails as a result of this. We'll see how it actually gets implemented. But From everything we're seeing, the communication in this country got less free, not more free on Thursday. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is one of the most bizarre things because it was entirely needless. The case for so-called net neutrality, which in fact is, is just the opposite, is this idea that you're going to have large internet service providers operating like quasi-monopolies against consumers. That's the rationale that led to this plan. But then the president himself came out not too long ago and said, I've, I've got it here in front of me, ever since the internet was created, it's been organized around basic principles of openness, fairness, and freedom. There are no gatekeepers. There are no toll roads. Even though the president himself was admitting, there's not a problem here. <laughs> But we're going to implement this 
scheme to prevent there ever being a problem. So then you have a number of internet activists, uh, for lack of a better term, who come out and say, yes, what we need for a free internet is government regulation. It's just the most bizarre confluence of, of forces that led to this. And as you point out, the, the obfuscation on the part of the FCC commissioner in not releasing the plan was almost uh, unconscionable. If you want to give the right more reason to suspect that the government is not just incompetent, but operating in, in a shady manner behind the scenes, there was no way, better way to do it than this. We'll see if this gets taken to court. Uh, Republicans are planning to launch some sort of legislative effort to stop it. But if the voting over uh, the DHS bill and, and amnesty is any indication, not sure they're going to get 60 votes for that either. Uh, interesting uh, tweet I saw yesterday. Net neutrality is about as accurate of a description as Affordable Care Act. So uh, mm-hmm. we'll, <laughs> well said. <laughs> we'll find out in time, I suppose. But uh, all right, on to the crazy martini now. And we've just talked about some pretty significant things, major foreign policy challenges in the world. There's obviously an existential terrorist threat uh, out there of people threatening to come to the United States and destroy our way of life. Uh, there's a major constitutional debate going on right now about the president's ability to go it alone on immigration reform. Uh, We've got three members of the FCC deciding what's going to happen with the Internet. Uh, There's reports out that the president is unilaterally banning certain bullets now. But those crises don't matter because uh, the Internet has decided the more important thing over the past 24 hours has been whether the dress is black and blue or gold and white. And apparently it all depends on the lighting and uh, how you uh, develop the picture. Uh, And CNN, of course, spent time yesterday uh, tracking down the llama that was on the loose somewhere (laughs) in Arizona. So how how do we get taken seriously as a country anymore when uh, we're so easily distracted by nonsense when there's major issues going on? This is uh, (laughs) it was so interesting because I left work around 6 p.m. last night. I logged back on to the internet after an extended absence of four or five hours. And this story about the dress had already happened. It shows how compressed the news cycle has become uh, in the, the age of the internet. It's an extraordinary story. This, uh, this dress that was worn by a, a mother of a bride-to-be uh, was posted on a private Tumblr page. And what's interesting, I think, in in stories like this is that it gets picked up, I think, uh, by BuzzFeed, some reporter whose job is or or perhaps just recreationally enjoys looking at obscure private Tumblr pages and makes a story out of it. And that seems to be in some way emblematic of the media culture that we now live in, our intimate private incidents of really no significance whatsoever that are able to be repackaged, put forward and cause a huge stir on the internet. It's not necessarily, you know, a a, a terrible thing, even a bad thing. It certainly creates, uh, makes for fun cultural memes, but it is interesting that we've come to a place where these sorts of stories and the stories that you're talking about otherwise, ISIS and the rest, are often on a level uh, when it comes to media attention. It's just just staggering. And we should point out that we're, you know, being inconsistent between martini number two and martini number three today. We still want the Internet to be free. We just want people to use a little bit of better judgment. (laughs) That's that's right. Exercise prudence (laughs) in your your, uh, news diet. Exactly. Oh, man. And the reactions of people to this random dress, uh, just they're really getting uh, emotional about this. Which... <laughs> vehement, vehement <laughs> uh, reaction to to whether this dress was white and gold or blue and black. For the record, I saw uh, white and gold and was told in no uncertain terms that I was utterly and completely wrong. And I feel still the, the stain on my character. <laughs> Oh, you're just going to be brooding all weekend. I know, about, uh, I know. I just do my need to go to confession. You know, do my do my penance. <laughs> oh, Ian, uh, good one to end on. It's been a crazy week, and it's hard to think of something Indeed. crazier than that. So, thanks again so much for filling in for Jim, and we'll talk to you later. Thanks so much, Greg. Ian Tuttle of Nash Review in for Jim Garrity today. Jim will be back on Monday. Join us then for the next Three Martini Lunch.